So, you see there is a profound influence of this hydrogen bonding in polymer molecules on the solubility, on the melting behavior, <coughs> on the mechanical properties, on the processability. So, uh, in case of nylon, in case of cellulose, in case of polyactonitrile, that means a polymer if it contains some polar atoms like oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, halogens, etcetera. So, that enter into hydrogen bonding and that influences the properties. So, you go through these structures and for new polymers, new uh, other uh, unknown polymers, whether there is hydrogen bonding or not, you can judge yourself looking at the structure. And this diagram shows the shows the uh, change in uh, properties say volume say specific volume or relative volume with temperature and if there is a discontinuity from the point of discontinuity we can assess the assess a transition temperature which is known as glass transition which makes a transition from solid brittle glassy state to amorphous flexible rubbery state. This occurs due to movement of short segments of polymer chains or segmental movement. This occurs due to onset of segmental movement of polymer chains. <coughs> For purely amorphous polymers, we get only one transition which is known as glass transition. For a semi crystalline polymer, since it contains some crystallites dispersed in amorphous uh, matrix, so one can visualize two types of transitions one is glass transition and the other is melting transition. In the glass transition, as I said, this glass transition <coughs> occurs due to segmental mobility, whereas melting transitions occurs due to mobility of the molecule as a whole. In between this slowly and slowly the mobility of the segments increases and at melting the entire molecule becomes mobile and so it uh, behaves like a fluid <coughs> beyond this melting transition temperature. This is another diagram which shows a change of specific values of polymers with the increase in temperature or decrease in temperature. You know what is specific heat of a material of a substance. So, from that definition you can understand and it shows a change in the slope of this curve uh, although it is not uh, sharp change, the gradual change is there. So, in order to get the transition you have to draw tangent at the two points then at the crossover point of the tangent that point gives you the glass transition temperature. Then gradually it undergoes a segmental movement and which helps the crystallization <coughs> or molecular ordering in the within the system. So, it shows crystallization temperature also and beyond the crystallization temperature if the temperature is further increased then it melts showing the melting transition and beyond melting again uh, you can have certain inflection due to degradation and those things can be uh, very uh, clear if one uh, uh, analyze a polymer sample through DSC differential scanning calorim calorimetry DSC experiment. It basically measures say, say enthalpy or energy change may be exothermic or endothermic. This is the temperature axis and you can get curve like this. Uh, 
or you can get curve like this, like this. Now, these are actually transitions again change of enthalpy during that transition either endothermic transition in these cases or exothermic transition. Now, these transitions can be <coughs> assigned to glass transition and at lower temperature that can be a characteristic of one particular polymer and beyond that again the other transition can be melting transition where the polymer melts and beyond that it actually shows degradation uh, energy change again uh, it shows the degradation. So, whenever you will be reading the structure proper uh, your uh, characterization of materials there you will know the detail principle of differential scalar, uh, scanning calorimetric analysis there you can know the detail, but this can help knowing the glass transition knowing that melting transition temperatures as well as the crystallinity in polymer sample. Because the quanti the area under this curve under this peak it is proportional to the crystallite or, or your uh, if it is crystalline melting then crystalline melting temperature then crystallinity can be uh, measured from uh, this area under this curve or if it is T g then you can get this initial final temperature and the peak temperature. So, you can report these three temperatures or only the peak temperature as T g. This diagram shows a effect of variation of branch length on the melting characteristics of isotactic poly alpha olefins say polypropylene suppose and it shows the properties versus temperature. So, you can explain such behavior of change of mechanical properties with increase in temperature from glassy solid brittle state to leathery characteristics to rubbery characteristics to uh, fluid like characteristics. Here you can explain with the help of molecular configurations also what is the what kind of molecular con change in molecular configuration, config configuration occurs from here you can understand. First of all on application of stress uh, and uh, mechanical stress as well as heat what happens there will be uh, stressing on the bond chemical bond as well as uh, that means, in, in uh, energy is applied in two different forms that helps the deformation of the material and that will be further augmented or accelerated by increasing the temperature. And this range of temperature between these phases is a glassy range then beyond that it becomes flexible then so it is a leathery range and this transition is the T g from uh, where it passes from glassy to leathery range then from leathery to rubbery uh, which becomes little fluid more fluid than leathery. Uh, so, and look at the modulus looking at these values one can know the stress requirement for polymer compounding for polymer processing say molding extrusion all this how much stress is required how much energy will be consumed for such processing those things can be uh, understood from these behaviors. This is a kind of phase diagram of this polymer materials which changes with molecular weight. That means, there is a temperature line above which it remains in one phase below which it remains in another phase. So, this either it, is, it will remain liquid phase or solid phase amorphous solid phase or crystalline solid phase that depends on the molecular weight and uh, the temperature. So, up to this molecular weight say 1000 molecular weight molecular mass below this temperature line it is crystalline solid above it is mobile liquid. Now, if you cross this molecular weight 
beyond this molecular weight it becomes viscous liquid. So, viscosity of this fluid is lower than the fluid within this region and you see it is due to the molecular size, higher molecular size, bigger molecules um, becomes viscous in liquid phase, more viscous in liquid phase than uh, the liquid phase uh, mobility of the liquid phase for discrete molecules. Now, this is the for amorphous materials this this is the line of glass transition the entire line is glass transitions. For crystalline material you see this may be considered as the melting transition line. For glass transition it can be considered from uh, this initial point to the final point. For crystalline polymers again the transition uh, line changes that means it, it goes up at high it occurs at higher temperature because after this uh, beyond this line it should be it becomes liquid below which it is solid. So, this is the region of tough plastic why it is called tough. Now, toughness if you want to understand the toughness stress if you look at the stress strain curve toughness depends on the stress level as well as the deformation level. So, if you compare this material with another material like this, so say A and this is this is B. So, B is more tough than A. What does it indicate? That means, it can withstand more stress and absorb energy before failure. So, this will be more, this material will be more resistant to impact impact load whereas, this will be less resistant to impact load. So, this is tougher than this one. So, this toughness depends on the stress level as well as the deformation level. When some impact energy is imposed on a material suppose if you give a blow uh, if it can absorb that energy then it is tough. So, you have seen the dock fenders, dock fenders those who have uh, Mm, uh, your uh, gone through ferry service in Kolkata. In the dock, there are some tires attached to the dock. When the uh, your, uh, your vessel touches it, it touches the tires, so it absorbs the energy. Otherwise, if there is no such tires which cannot absorb energy, the vessel may be damaged. That means that material is tough. You understand? So, toughness depends on the mobility of the segments, mobility of the segments, deformation of the segments, deformation of the polymer chains. So, here you see here this is a T g beyond T g that means, below T g is brittle for amorphous material, above T g it is little flexible. So, it can absorb the shock it can absorb the impact load and this will continue till their melting transition. Beyond melting transition that can be mobile liquid, may be viscous liquid. So, again that is related to uh, molecular weight of the polymer also. So, this shows a picture of behavior of polymers with temperature and their molecular weight. As you go on increasing the molecular weight that can withstand higher temperature that can remain dimensionally stable that can be tougher, tough material that can behave like a plastic that can behave like an elastomer. So, you can predict looking at this kind of phase diagram. Now, here are certain glass transition values are shown if you try to correlate these values. LDP I explained 
before also it is T g is quite low it may be again minus 120 degree y minus 115 degree like that. Now, T g these values are not fixed actually because it can vary from one batch of polymer to the other batch of polymer because not all the batches of polymers which are manufactured in industry will contain same molecular weight level and molecular weight distribution that is why it can vary. So, it is not fixed if you see some value in some report in some paper in some journal in some book it may be written minus 115 degree it is not wrong but particularly the value reported over there from one experiment which shows that it, it is uh, this value is minus 115 degree but you have seen in a book it is minus 125 degree both are right. It gives you some general idea that the T g values of uh, these polymer different polymers are such. So, if you compare say T g value of polystyrene you see it is 100 degree with this L d p minus 125 why? why because polystyrene contains one pendant phenyl ring. So, that makes the polymer this phenyl ring bulky phenyl ring makes the polymer rigid. Achha. This is for hydrocarbon plastics. Now, if you look into other polymers say like PVC, polyacnoitile compare these polymers that means, the substituent substituent at the carbon atom chlorine, nitrile group, C n group, acetate group, alcohol group, acrylate group, ester group, uh, again another substitution methyl acrylate, methyl and acrylate group, methyl and methacrylate group, butyl, butyl methacrylate group, you see the variation, you can easily correlate. That means, the substitution on the polymer chain these substitutions alter the glass transition values depending on their bulkiness, on their polarity etcetera. That means, if you correlate this thing with cohesive energy density along with this bulkiness, then you can correlate their T g properties, how the T g properties are varying. You so, look at this uh, methyl acrylate and ethyl acrylate. Methyl acrylate this is methyl acrylate this is ethyl acrylate you see this is methyl group here, this is the difference between these two polymers ethyl and ethyl and for that the length of this uh, alkyl group has drastically changed this T g value from minus 24 to 6 degree. Further if you compare another polymer this is PMMA, compare this polymer with this polymer, its T g value is minus 24 uh, methyl, uh, my, uh, 6 degree, 6 degree, its T g is 105 degree. So, that change has come from this methyl group. Now, this shows further examples of other, po other polymers that T g and T m venting transition both say you go through this these are available in the book you look at the structure try to understand why their T g values are differing from each other why their T m values are differing from each other.
examples of various polymers poly paraphenylin poly tetramethylene oxide polyphenylene ether if you compare each of them the only phenyl ring there is no aromatic ring only alkyl chain methylene groups oxygen is there again if you compare this polymer with this polymer oxygen is there which is flexible ethyl linkage is flexible in a polymer chain so here you see although uh, because of the presence of methyl ring a uh, methylene group its tg is minus 80 degree when this four carbon atoms of this four methylene units are replaced by a phenyl ring keeping this ethyl linkage same its tg has been changed to 80 degree plus 80 degree So, this way you compare uh, these polymers with the structures and their glass transition and melting transitions. There are many examples here. Now, let us come to the solubility behavior, dissolution behavior of polymers. Already I have devoted some time to explain before you what do we mean by solubility. Now, for solution to take place, the free energy is the driving force in the solution process which decreases at constant temperature following the equation. That means, a solution can take place or miscibility of two components can take place. Solubility, what do we mean by solubility? If we mix a component A with a component B, we can get a solution provided A is miscible with B. In these two components, out of these two components, one may be, may be considered as a solvent and the other may be considered as a solid. It you can take the example of a simple case of a solution say sugar in water. Suppose A is sugar, B is water, it forms a homogeneous solution <coughs> because sugar is miscible with water. Now, if you take A as a polymer 1, B as a polymer 2, B as a polymer 2, then you can get a polymer blend of polymer 1 and polymer 2, provided they are miscible. That means, you can say this polymer blend may be considered as a polymer alloy if both of them are miscible or compatible. So, we can get a new product from two component polymers by mixing one polymer with another polymer provided they are miscible. We can say that these two component polymers are miscible at entire range of compositions between 0 to 100 parts by weight. means this is a pure polymer 1, say P 1, P 2, 0 to 100 and 100 to 0, these are the two pure and in between you can have 90, 10, 80, 20, 70, 30, 40, uh, 
40, 60, 50, 50 like this. So, in this entire range of compositions, if we see that these component polymers are fully meshable, we can say it is a meshable polymer blend. But it can so happen that one polymer can be miscible with another polymer up to certain specified composition. Say suppose P 1 up to 10 parts by weight can be miscible with P 2 with 90 parts by weight. Beyond 10 parts of P 1, it will say separate into phases that will be two phase system. That means, there will be some new phase boundaries will be created. One phase of polymer 1 and the another phase of polymer 2. That is, we cannot say that beyond this 10 percent of P 1, it is not miscible. So, we can say it is an immiscible blend. So, this is the concept how to know that one polymer will be miscible with another polymer or one polymer uh, can be dissolved in a solvent or one solvent can be a good solvent for one polymer and the vice versa. So, the that depends on the interaction between a polymer and a solvent and that can be understood by a solubility parameter delta concept which is the square root of cohesive energy density C E D cohesive energy density. Delta for non polar solvents is equal to the square root of heat of vaporization per unit volume heat of vaporization per unit volume under square root. Okay. And this delta or solubility parameter can be calculated if we know the formula repeat unit formula of a polymer, if we know the chemical formula of a solvent. So, we can calculate the solubility parameter value of a solvent as well as a polymer. Now, you see heat of mixing of a solute and a solvent is expressed by delta H m delta H m equal to phi 1 and phi 2 where phi 1 and phi 2 are the volume fractions of polymer 1 and polymer 2 or solute and the solvent. If you consider 1 as the solute and 2 as the solvent, so these are the volume fractions okay. and delta 1 and delta 2 are the solubility parameters of the two components solute and the solvent. This can be two polymers also polymer 1 and polymer 2. Now, for nonpolar solvents the solubility parameter is also expressed as as you have seen earlier it is the uh, heat of vaporization per unit volume then delta is equal to delta H v minus R t by v uh, replacing this molar volume replacing molar volume v by the ratio m by d we get this relation simple derivation we get this relation okay, where d is the density m is the molecular weight and delta H V is the heat of vaporization, R is the gas constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin and M is the molecular weight of the repeat unit of the polymer. Now, since this delta solubility parameter relates with this heat of vaporization, heat of vaporization 
if you if you correlate this with you the in, uh, intermolecular interactions or interactions between the solvent and the solute or even the solvent during the evaporation or during the boiling of solvent what happens if the energy supplied to the solvent is a uh, crosses beyond the crosses beyond the intermolecular forces of interaction then only it starts vaporization start boiling vapor formation okay so it is very much related to the heat of vaporization and which is related to the cohesive energy density and i told you what is cohesive energy density earlier now look at these values characteristics of typical primary valence bonds bond length bond distance and bond dissociation energies of course these bond dissociation energies has nothing to do with the vaporization of the molecules in which these bonds are present what i mean to say if you think of the uh, energy for van der waals bonds or hydrogen bonds which is around 2 to and the below 5 kilo calories per mole. Okay. If the solvation energy goes beyond 5 kilo calories per mole, then only it can break those hydrogen bonds. Do you understand? It take the example of cellulose. Last day I told cellulose contains extensive hydrogen bonding. Almost all the hydroxyl groups in anhydroglucose ring are involved in intermolecular hydrogen bonding. It is a thermoplastic polymer, when it is put in water it is supposed to go into solution, but the solvation energy of water at room temperature is not sufficient enough to break those hydrogen bonds. But if you add other chemicals then that chemical energy would be would cross that hydrogen bond energy and that breaks and then all the cellulose goes into solution. Exploiting this phenomena, technologies have been developed to manufacture processed cotton, mercerized cotton, cellophane, viscose rayon or other regenerated cellulose fibers. Okay. So, this is done by breaking of the hydrogen bonds only with the help of chemical energy. So, but actually these strong bonds again that depends on the, the position of the atoms in the periodic table. If there is a more distance between the atoms in the periodic table, the energy becomes more, polarity increases so energy uh, becomes more. So, bond dissociation energy becomes more. So, this way you can correlate looking at these values. Uh, look at this data cohesive energy density which was calculated which was calculated or sometimes experimentally determined for these different polymers. You see for polyethylene cohesive energy density is 56 to 64 for polystyrene it is higher again for polyisobutylene it is lower than this value, natural lower is almost comparable, polyvinyl acetate it is little higher, polyvinyl chloride little higher, polymethyl methacrylate still higher, polyethylene terephthalate still higher. This way if you go on uh, move from polyethylene to different other polymers and if you look into the structures and the their configurations and the atoms present over there, then you can correlate their cohesive energy density. Cohesive energy density is the sum total of secondary valence force, sum total of secondary valence force or secondary valence energy, valence force energy related to that energy related to the secondary valence force, total quantity per mole of course, per mole, per gram mole or per mole. Okay. Here it is shown per 
cc cal calories per cc energy consumed or required to break those secondary bond forces are like this 56 to 64 calories per cc okay you can calculate in terms of mole mole basis as i was telling solubility parameter can be calculated from this relation delta is equal to d into sum of molar attraction constants and these molar attraction constants are nothing but the measure, uh, as a me these are used as for the measure of the cohesive energy density g values calories per cc square root per mole and m is the molecular weight and this g can be calculated this g can be calculated because uh, it has been evaluated that this g values molar attractions constants known as moles molar attraction constants measured by some experiments at 25 degree celsius for if there is a methyl group its contribution is 214 for methylene group it is 133 for ca is connected to other three bonds it is 28 for carbon for carbon attached to four different atoms it is minus 93 for ch2 attached to a double bond it is 190 so you can correlate this thing with the bond energies that means these value if these values are available suppose if you take a polymer say this polymer and you are asked to calculate this g values Hmm. So, contribution due to this C H 2 group is there. So, here in this polymer in per repeat unit there are 2 C H 2 groups. So, you can have this total value for this repeat 2 into 133. In the previous formula you see sum of G values here you write this 2 into 133 for G, G is equal to 2, 2 into 133. You can have a molecule or repeat unit formula like this here you have to have the contribution from ch2 you have to have the contribution from ch that means like this you have to have the contribution from this you have to have the contribution from oxygen or you have to have the contribution from OCS3. All these contributions for different groups present in a molecule in the repeat unit formula. And if these data are available for different, you see, it is only very, a few examples are given here, shown over here. In the data book, say there is a data book. is a huge data book available in the library known as polymer handbook handbook editors are i e margut and j j j brandrup so far i remember brandrup you look at that value you will get several physical constants for polymers these molar attraction constants their tg values of different polymers tm values of different polymers many physical data you can get from the, those books. There you can get the small molar attraction constants, exhaustive list of uh, molar attraction cons contribution to molar attraction constants in 
chemical compounds that may be a simple solvent that may be a polymer molecule. So, with the help of those data available in data book, you can calculate the solubility, solubility parameter either for a solvent or for a polymer. Now, you will ask sir, what is the necessity of calculating solubility parameter? Is there any necessity? Yes, there is a necessity. If you deal with polymer, if you deal with polymer, suppose you want to uh, do some work on application of polymers, you want to make a biomedical device, say for drug delivery device made of polymer you want to make a conducting polymer film for sensing purpose. Okay. You want to make a surface coating using a polymer. So, for all these you have to go through some processing steps involving solvents say solution processing or melt processing. If you go for solvent solution processing, then you have to go for selection of a suitable solvent. It is unknown to you, but being a polymer scientist, if you know that this is this polymer, if you know the repeat unit formula of that polymer, then you can easily calculate the solubility parameter of that particular polymer from this equation from this relation, you calculate the solubility parameter for the polymer, then you see what solvent should be suitable for dissolution of this polymer or what would be a good solvent for this polymer. How to charge then? Now, if the solubility parameter of a polymer and a solvent are very close say if the difference is uh, say 0 to uh, sorry 1 to 2.5 the difference in solubility parameter is 1 to 2.5 then that can be miscible. If the solubility parameter is almost identical then that solvent may be a good solvent for that polymer. So, if you know the solubility parameter value suppose it is 10 solubility parameter delta value for your polymer it is 10. Then you should find out a solvent whose solubility parameter is close to 10 or 10, say 10.5 or 11 or 11.5 or even 12. So, if you find a solvent whose solubility parameter is close to this 10, then you can select that solvent. It is again not always true that that solvent can dissolve or the solubility of that polymer cannot be very may not be very high in that solvent, but it can be used as a solvent. Say you can easily dissolve 1 gram of polymer in 100 gram of solvent, but you may not be able to dissolve 5 gram of the same polymer in the same solvent 100 gram of the same solvent you understand. So, 1 gram is soluble, but 5 gram is not soluble. So, that depends on the solubility limit, what is the solubility value. Okay. Look at the data. So, from these molar attraction constants, you can calculate the solubility parameter. Huh. Look at the solubility parameter values which was calculated or experimentally determined values. For hydrogen it is 3, for dimethyl siloxane it 
is 5.5, difluorodichloromethane 5.5, ethane 6.0. Okay. These are for poorly hydrogen bonded solvents, carbon tetrachloride, propyl benzene, decaline hydrocarbon solvent, xylene aromatic hydrocarbon solvent, benzene aromatic hydrocarbon solvent, styrene structure is differ, uh, different from that of benzene, tetraline, chlorobenzene. So, you, these solvents are considered as solvents whose hydrogen bonding effect is minimum, poorly hydrogen bonded solvents. Now, the boiling point of a solvent would be high if the molecules in that solvent have very strong hydrogen bonding. So, you look into these values, solubility parameters of moderately hydrogen bonded solvents. So, solubility parameter values increase, increasing or increasing in these solvents. Then you see for solubility parameter of strongly hydrogen bonded solvents, earlier I told you a statement that a like dissolves like. That means, the chemical nature of the two solvents are equal or do the two components are, are close chemical nature, say solute and the solvent, then they can be miscible and one can act as the solvent for the other. And that can be uh, calculated or from the molecular point of view, from the chemical nature uh, point of view, one can see uh, in terms of cohesive energy density or solubility parameter values. So, you have seen the solubility parameter values of poorly hydrogen bonded solvents, moderately hydrogen bonded solvents and strongly hydrogen bonded solvents. Now, we come to the polymer side. If your polymer contains strong hydrogen bonding, strong intramolecular hydrogen bonding, so you have to take strongly hydrogen bonded solvents then uh, for its dissolution as its solvent. So, look into the polymer, solubility parameter values for polymers, poly tetrafluoroethylene 5 point. Again you see it shows different values for poorly hydrogen bonded, moderately hydrogen bonded and uh, strongly hydrogen bonded solvents. So, ester gum it is a polymer, what is ester gum? Ester gum is a resin made from uh, terephthalic acid and thalic anhydride uh, sorry uh, thalic anhydride or terephthalic acid or uh, and some glycol using some oils also in combination with oil. So, the ester gum because those are ester like polymers. So, ester gum and alkyd resins with soybean oils, silicone polymer, polyvinyl ether, polybutyl acrylate, polybutyl methacrylate, you see that uh, their solubility parameter values uh, lying are lying in the ranges from 7 to 10 like this for these polymers. I will come to explain later it should be silicone not silicon, silicone C O N E silicone, silicone dimethyl polysiloxane silicone polymer silicone the one grade polyisobutylene polyethylene 
is a trade name of a polymer, polyvinyl beta ether, natural rubber, hypalon, which is chlorosulfonated polyethylene, chlorosulfonated polyethylene, and then other polymers, ethyl cellulose, chlorinated rubber, uh, damar gum, that again varsamid, vars trade name polystyrene, polyvinyl acetate, polyvinyl chloride. Phenyl resin, nitrile rubber, PMMA, carbo wax, polyethylene oxide, polycarbonate, cyclized rubber. These are the values. Solubility parameter values for polymers again, mylar in the form of film, mylar film, polyethylene triethylate film, vinyl chloride, vinyl acetate copolymer, polyurethane. Styrene acrylate copolymer, CELAC, cellulose. So, <coughs> you see, here from this data, if you know the solubility parameter delta for a polymer, so suppose it is 11. <coughs> then you look at the solubility parameter of a solvent, go to the solvent chart. So, here you see there are solvents whose solubility parameters are 11.4, 11.5, 12, 10.9, 10.6, 10.3 and go to the polymer chart, see this polymer, you take a polar polymer, say alkyl resin or this no, it will be little complicated, you take natural rubber, example of natural rubber. Natural rubber, its solubility parameter is around say 8.5, okay. And its solvent for natural, good solvent for natural rubber is benzene, xylene, toluene. These are the solvents, hydrocarbon solvents. Decaline, tetraline, these are also good solvent for natural rubber. So, if you put uh, natural rubber in benzene, it will go into solution. So, look at the solubility parameter values of benzene and <coughs> benzene, toluene, xylene. Nine point two. For benzene, it is nine point two. So, difference is nine point two minus eight point five. It's very close. So, if the solubility parameter values of the two polymers are close, then <coughs> we can consider that these polymers, this solvent, this particular solvent you can be uh, used as a very good solvent. So, this way you can go for selection of solvent for a suitable polymer. So, if there is any question on this thing you ask me, any doubt? Any question on the structure, properties, relations of polymers? But bond energy is related to the cohesive energy density. Of course. But the 
you take you take the example of polyethylene and and polyethylene terephthalate or nylon in nylon there is hydrogen bond in addition to and was forces say london dispersion force and this hydrogen bond is present due to the presence of nitrogen and oxygen nhco amide linkage amide linkage that so this polar polar interaction is there so due to polar polar interaction this hydrogen bonds coming into picture in case of polyethylene no polar polar interaction only it is london dispersion force where from it is coming it is coming from the bonding electrons induced effect of bonding electrons okay so that is the cohesive energy density of polyethylene in case of nylon cohesive energy density is the contribution from polar bond as well as non polar bonds okay that is why nylon is soluble in acid it needs a strong solvent it can dissolve it can be dissolved in uh, say dimethyl formamide or uh, dimethyl acetamide or dimethyl sulfoxide these are highly polar solvents so highly polar solvents can dissolve this polar polymer even there are some polymers like polyimides sometimes cresols metacresols paracresols phenols concentrated sulfuric acid these are used as solvent for those polymers you understand whereas these common solvents cannot dissolve them tetrahydrofuran is a good solvent for polyphenol chloride what is the solvent for polyphenol alcohol water this is a water soluble polymer okay but hydrocarbon solvents cannot dissolve this polyphenol alcohol polyethylene for polyethylene although this uh, hydrocarbon solvents can be a good solvent but it does not dissolve at room temperature you have to break the crystallites so for ldp toluene is a good solvent at its boiling temperature for hdp xylene is a good solvent for hdp xylene is a good solvent so you please go through these slides i have told you have taken some notes and then uh, read some books complete the note and try to understand thank you